And this week we are diving in at Philippians 2. So if you've got a a Bible or an iPhone or whatever it is that you want to use for Scripture, feel free to open that up. I'm going to be hitting the majority of Philippians 2 today. I'll reference a few other Scriptures, but most of it's going to be rooted in Philippians 2, so you're welcome to open that up and follow us along. Well, as we're doing this, as you cover a chapter a week, you do somewhat have to pull some of the high points. You can't always dig down in the minutia. And sometimes it's good to have a sermon series that's kind of an overview from, from a, you know, a 10,000 feet view. When you're up on top of the mountains, you can see stuff that you can't see when you're down below in the valley and the trees, right? And so sometimes it's good to get a little higher up here to get this broader perspective as we, as we work our way through Philippians. And, and it's my prayer and what our intent is as I'm going through this that, that God would use His Word to change our perspective about how we do life, okay? And, and now, I don't know about all of you, but I love it when I find out something new. I love to learn. I'm, I'm naturally curious. Uh, I, I continually learn. I don't remember if I've told you guys this story. I told my last church, I know for sure. There, there was a night, this was a number of years ago, and, and the internet is a wonderful and dangerous thing. And I was, uh, I don't remember how I got onto the topic, but you know, I'd heard that Lake Superior, of course, is, holds the most fresh water in the world, right? And that's because of its total overall surface area, but as well as its depth. Lake Superior is deep, so it, it, its, its overall depth is quite deep, and it holds a lot of water. And so, you know, as happens, you start reading about something and, you know, click on one link and it leads to the next link and and pretty soon you're like 57 pages from where you began. And so I started looking up what are the biggest lakes in the world because I, you know, for no real reason, it's not a useful thing unless I go on Jeopardy or something. But I I start looking up, you know, what is is this biggest lakes in the world? So I start looking and, and then I end up proceeding to spend like the next four hours. It was like three in the morning when I went to bed finally when I realized how long I'd been studying these lakes. I start reading about these giant lakes that are up like in the Yukon and Canada. And I mean, there's some, there's some huge lakes out there, right? A uh, giant lake in the Siberian area of, of uh, Siberia of, of Russia. And, and I just studied and studied. And, and as I realized, you know, like I said, I'm naturally curious. I'm naturally naturally interested in learning new things, I, I remember sitting there and looking over and seeing that my computer says it's three in the morning going, I don't know if this is worth learning all of this stuff that's absolutely meaningless in my life, but it sure was fun, right? And so I went into bed and, and finally went to sleep. But I, I love to learn new things, and I, like I said, I don't know about you, and I especially like new things that change my perspective on things, right? Things that cause me to have a, a mind shift, so to speak. When, when my mind goes from thinking one way to another. Um, you know, you had some preconceptions and you learn something and it completely transforms the way that you were thinking. And my hope is, as we study this book of Philippians, uh, you've, many of you have heard Philippians many times before. Philippians is not a new book to many of us. But my hope is that nonetheless we're able to find that, that little spot in your soul where that kind of light bulb goes off, where that light switch flips, where all of a sudden you're like, huh, I hadn't thought of it that way before, where you, you get to experience that, that mind shift. And then through that, that God will speak to you and that it will inspire you to think differently as you move forward in your life. So if you missed the first week, uh, two weeks ago, in that first sermon, we talked a little bit about the background of Philippians first. Philippians, of course, written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, He's written this to the church at Philippi, a church that he actually started in about the year 52 AD. And this was a church that Paul dearly loved. He really liked these people, okay? He, he, He had a tremendous place in his heart for them. He liked all of his churches, I suspect, but you know, like if you have to pick a favorite child, he would have picked the Philippian child, right? I think that's kind of how he felt about this church. And, and um, he, he truly loves these people. It comes out in his letter as he writes to them. And what had happened is they had sent him a gift, a, a financial support gift. And if you know Paul, he was reluctant to ever take people's money because he didn't want to be beholden to any of their agendas. He didn't want anybody to be able to say that, because somebody had given them money for their ministry, that now they would have influence over him. He wanted nothing to do with that. So normally he wouldn't deal with money from other people. He was a tent maker. He would do it on his own. But he had hit a rough time in his ministry. Um, He was, in fact, in prison at this time, and they were broke. And so this Philippian church takes a love offering, and it turns out it's a pretty tremendous offering. It's quite a bit of money, it would appear, from the way Paul writes about it in Scripture. 
And they send it to him, and he actually accepts it from this church. And so as he's writing back this letter, um, it, it's effectively in sorts kind of a thank you letter for their loving him in return. Uh, if you read carefully throughout four chapters of the book of Philippians, one of the things you will see is Paul continually referencing the mind, okay? And, and you're going to see Paul talk about that, about how we should think and what we should remember um, and, and what our attitude in life and ministry should be. And so today I want to talk to you about a different way of thinking when we have this changed perspective. And we're going to jump off, as I said, Philippians 2, starting in verse 1. And it says this, uh, Philippians 2, 1 through 2, it says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Paul says. Now, we know from history, from Paul's writings elsewhere, that there was a little bit of division that was going on within the church. And so Paul is writing to this church, encouraging them to be like-minded, to think, so to speak, the same thoughts. In fact, if you're taking notes, um, and, and there are some sermon note places in your bulletins there. If you, if you didn't notice, it's, it's got some... This week I put some fancy Greek words on there, and I'll reference those along the way. But you're welcome to take notes. And, and the little Greek word that is translated as like-minded is the word phronero. phronero. And, and what it means is that we need to set our affections on. It means to, to think. It means to be single-minded, in fact, in our thought. And so Paul says... I want you, I want the church, I want the believers, I want the hearers of my word, Paul is saying, to be like-minded, to be single-minded. I want you to think similarly on similar things. Now, well, what does that matter, Pastor, right? I mean, what difference does that make? That's the question we're always asking as we read Scripture. Well, if you look throughout Scripture... There are many, many, many powerful verses about how important our thoughts and our minds actually are to our spiritual walk. Uh, scripture gives a whole bunch of references to this, and let me just give you a few of them. Uh, James, in the book of James, says that the double-minded man is unstable in all that he does, right? The double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. Paul says, I want you to be like-minded or single-minded. Paul also tells the Romans, he says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. You've heard this before, right? But be transformed by what? The renewing of our minds. And then he says, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Paul also speaks about this to the Corinthian church. And he tells them to take every thought captive, right? To make it obedient to Christ. And then Paul says to the Philippians, this is another passage here from Philippians 2, that whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, Paul says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. Okay? Or how about the book of Proverbs? The Old Testament covers this too. Proverbs says this. Proverbs says, a man thinks in his heart, and so he is. So maybe here's a mind shift for you, perhaps. If you think you are what you do, write this down. How you think determines what you become. I'll say that again. How you think determines what you will become. Paul says this. All over in his writing. Paul says that everything he does... Every fiber of his being, every word that he writes, every word that he teaches, every drop of sweat that he sweats even, every breath that Paul takes, he says, is about Jesus. That's what Paul was about. And if you were here two weeks ago, you heard this clearly, as Paul says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? To live as Christ and to die as gain. He's saying whatever may come, whatever may happen, 
whatever the few days I may have in the rest of my life, he doesn't know at that point, whatever they are, I'm okay with how it goes because how it goes, it's going to go for Christ. He was in chains as he wrote the church at Philippi. Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. Paul was waiting to hear a judgment against him and that judgment may be execution. And we do know eventually Paul does lose his life. And so Paul is living knowing that's the possibility as he writes this church. And he says, to live is for Christ. To die is gain. Right? And he says in other places, I want you to be like-minded. I want you to think in a similar way. Okay, so Paul, and everything he did is about Jesus. Now, why is that so important again? Well, because as a Christian, I'm going to assume if you're here this morning, you're probably a Christ follower. You're not necessarily so, but you probably are. And if you say that you're a Christian, and then you look at the way that Jesus lived, you'll probably find yourself falling a little bit short, right? You ever read about Jesus in the Bible and thought, yeah, that's, I'm not that good, right? You find yourself saying that when you read about Jesus? I do. I'm not Jesus. I'm not good as Jesus. I'm not nearly, I mean, I, even John, I mean, John the baptizer, this, this, was a, this was one of the big hitters of Scripture, right? And he's even like, I can't even hold Jesus' sandals. I'm not worthy. Well, if he wasn't worthy, if Paul wasn't worthy, well, what kind of worm am I? You ever feel like that? I do. When I read these guys, it's like, oh, I just don't feel adequate. But that's not necessarily what is expected of us. Okay? I want to be clear on this. We say, I could never live like that. God knows we couldn't live like that, and I understand that. But God wants us to at least try to live like that. It's easy to look at Jesus and say, I could never be as loving as Jesus, right? It's easy to look at someone like him and say, I could never be as generous as Jesus. I could never be as full of grace as Jesus. I, I could never, ever please God the same way that Jesus did, right? But let me shift your mind a little bit. Because it's really all about what goes on in our minds. Because if we learn to think like Jesus thought, then we can also learn to live like Jesus lived. If we can begin to transform our minds to think more and more like Jesus, we will begin to live more and more like Jesus. Now, we will never arrive. We're always going to be dragging behind us the baggage of our sin. Okay? We're always going to continually have mistakes. We're never going to be perfect. We're never going to be Jesus, and that's okay. God knows that. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us, in fact. But each and every day of our lives, we can begin to take our thoughts captive. We can begin to intentionally try to think more like Jesus. And as we think more like Jesus, that will begin to cause us to live more like Jesus. So while we might not get there, we can work our way in that direction. We can learn to live more empowered by the Spirit of God. How did Jesus think? Right? Well, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you look at his teachings, that Jesus taught and lived in a very specific way. He thought that loving God and loving people were the two most important things. Would anybody disagree? Love God, love people, right? That's what Jesus continually, continually points towards. In fact, when he's asked, hey, Jesus, right? What's the most important command? Because you remember they had like over 600 rules and regulations that the Jews were following at the time of Jesus. Jesus, which one of these is the most important? Well, we know Jesus' response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself, right? Jesus was all about loving God and loving people. And Paul was teaching this very same principle. And he's saying, if you'll be like-minded, if 
you won't think like the world thinks, but instead if you will think like Jesus thinks and taught, if you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind, if you'll think like Jesus, you can actually begin to live more like Jesus. At the end of the day, that should be our primary goal as Christians. To be Jesus-like people doing Jesus-like things. Living more like Jesus. And here's the way Paul taught this in verse 3. He says this. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count yourself or count others as more significant than yourself. Now I've put in your notes this Greek word that's translated in humility. And, and I, I would warn you, don't, don't try to say that word out loud here today because you may get a cramp in your tongue and I'm not massaging your tongue. Okay? I studied Greek for four years, in fact, and I'm not going to try saying it. So I don't recommend you try saying it. But that's the word for humility that you see there in your sermon notes if you're following along. And within humility comes this, this broad idea to be, to be modest, right? It means having humility of the mind, a, a, a lowliness of mind if you're familiar with the King James Version of the Bible. I choose in my mind to position myself as lower than others so as to please God so as to love other people. Verse 4 and 5 says this. Paul says, Let each of you look not only to his or her own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this again in mind, Paul says, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying here that our attitude matters. Did you realize that? You've heard this before, right? Attitude matters. Your attitude matters. One of the things I've learned in life is that attitude is that little thing that makes a big difference, right? The difference of being, somebody, being with somebody who's positive or somebody who's negative while you're doing the exact same task is enormous, right? You could be doing the worst task. You could be shoveling, hand shoveling, pig manure, right? You ever done it, man? Your eyes water, that stuff burns. It smells terrible. Like gets into every pore of your being. If it isn't sloppy and wet, then you're like breathing it in. It's just terrible. Man, there's probably something worse than pig manure, but I don't want to find out, okay? And you're out there slopping in the pig manure and you're cleaning it up even in your boots or your waders or whatever you got on. If you've got somebody who's fun to do it with, somebody who's joyful in spirit, well, it's not nearly as bad. You've got somebody out there with you who's just cussing it the whole time and mumbling and grumbling and groaning, right? That becomes the worst task ever. I mean, it's already a bad task. Man, you do that with somebody who's just a grouch? Ugh. Imagine how Moses felt leading the Israelites through the desert. You got like four million people rumbling and grumbling every morning, right? I feel sorry for Moses. I really do. Because attitude matters. Paul's saying that. Paul's saying attitude, that little thing, makes all the difference. It changes our trajectory in life. There's a lot of good things about a positive attitude. Let me give you an example, right? So, so there's, there's this young boy. And he's in his backyard. He gets out his baseball bat. He gets out his baseball ball, right? And he's out there in the backyard. And he's thinking to himself, I am the greatest hitter who has ever lived. You know, kids do that sometimes, right? So he's thinking, I'm the greatest hitter who's ever lived. So he gets out there. I used to do this as a kid. Maybe you did. He throws the ball up, right? Has the bat. He's going to take a swing. Well, what happens? He misses. Thud. Lands on the ground. He looks at the ball, laughs, ha, 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 right? Ah, picks it up. We'll give it another go. So he takes that ball, throws it up, swings as hard as he can. Oh. It's on the ground again. He giggles again. I mean, kids laugh. 
He bends over, picks it up again, still thinking to himself, I am the greatest hitter of all time. Takes that ball, throws it up in the air, just really winds up and lays into it, right? Swings the biggest swing he's ever swung, as hard as he could possibly swing. Gets his legs and back into it. And the ball hits the ground at his feet. He bends over and picks it up. Thinks to himself, I'm the greatest pitcher of all time because I just struck out the greatest batter of all time. (laughs) Right? If you don't get that joke, we'll explain it later. (laughs) But your attitude matters. It really, really matters. How we go through life. When it comes to our attitude, it makes a big, big difference. So what is your attitude? Very simply, your attitude is mental habits. That's what it is. It's your habits of thought. It's the way that you've trained your brain to think. And what do we know about habits? Right? Habits are things that we have acquired. And we can create good habits. And we can create bad habits. Right? Maybe naturally you find yourself as a pessimistic kind of person. Okay? That that may be true. But you don't have to stay that way. We can change that. We have to choose to change it, however, but we can change that. Now, yeah, sure, you may not be the most glowing, radiant, happy-go-lucky person ever, eventually. But you can quit being a sourpuss. You can quit being a grump. By making choices, we can change our attitude. And our attitude actually matters because our attitude speaks to our witness for Christ. And so we need to be conscious of what our attitude is. We need to take hold of that, Paul is telling us. He's telling the church, our attitude matters. He's telling the believers, our attitude matters. And so we have to be intentional and our actions need to be intentional and focused so that we repeat the good and not the bad. So that we change our trajectory in a positive direction. So that we do not become conformed to the patterns of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, what Paul said isn't simply just only have a positive attitude, although that is very important. But what he said was, have a Christ-like attitude, right? Paul says, have a Christ-like attitude. Our attitude should be that of Jesus Christ. Verse 5, that's exactly what he says. He says, have this mind or have this attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And what did this attitude lead him to? What did it lead him to do? Verse 6 and 7. It says, talking about Jesus, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count himself equal with God and equality to be a thing that we might grasp, Paul says. But instead, Jesus, Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men. So let me, let me give you this mind shift with this. Because so often in this world, we want to think, we don't like to admit this, but we want to think so often in this world that everything's about us, right? We're prone to that. I'm prone to that. I've been studying this this week, and I've been convicted in more than one occasion. I had a thought last night. I had a thought this morning, in fact. I had a thought this morning that All of a sudden I realized, it was funny, because where is it at? Somewhere here. I don't know what I did with it. Well, there's a card here that I showed you earlier. I know it exists. It's disappeared. But that card that came from the teachers, right? I showed it to you. I said, we stick it up on the board. I'll find it later. Well, when that was sitting on my desk when I walked in, you know what I thought? Oh, look, birthday card. Right? Because we make it about us. And my birthday was just a week ago. 
So I'm thinking, oh yeah, somebody sent me a late birthday card. Sweet. Oh. Well, this is better than a birthday card, actually. But that, I was thinking it was about me. Right? We do that. We, we, we want it to be about us. You know? We want our friends to be about us. Our culture is selfie-focused, right? People taking pictures of themselves in places all over the world. Right? That, that's the nature of our culture. But hear this important truth today. Pleasing God is not about self-promotion. Pleasing God is about self abandonment. See, Jesus didn't consider equality with God something for us to grasp. The word of God that's translated as grasp literally means to rob, to plunder, to rape, to steal from. Equality is not something with God that we should conceive of being able to grasp. The examples in Scripture of people who thought they could be equal with God, well, think about that for a minute. Satan. When Lucifer was in heaven, he wanted to be like God. How does that story end? Not so well for Satan and about a third of all the angels. Right? Satan wanted to be like God. What happens when Satan, as the serpent, comes to Adam and Eve in the garden? Right? When Satan comes to them, how does he tempt them? He says, hey Eve, hey Eve, listen, you could be like God, right? Satan tempts Eve, saying, let's open your eyes so that you can see as God sees. That's the trick he uses on her. And what a mistake it is to think that we might be equal with God in any way, shape, or form. Equality with God is not something that we should grasp. Because it's not about self-promotion. It is about self-abandonment. We lose our life in Christ and find Christ's life then in us. The text goes on to say that he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but that Jesus himself made himself to be nothing. Think about that for a moment, right? Jesus, who had every right, who was God in heaven, God in all of his glory, Jesus is fully God. Jesus stripped himself of everything that he had in heaven to come down to this little rotating ball of mud that we live on to be a servant. And not only to be a servant, to be a servant to those who sinned against him. Right? He was the one who had every right to be praised. And yet, if you read through scripture, here we find Jesus coming down, kneeling, washing the feet of the lowest of the low. Jesus made himself to be nothing. It's not about self-promotion. It's about self-abandonment. It's about me saying my life is not my own. I've been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus and my life is now all about him is what Paul is telling us. Jesus made himself nothing. Taking on in very nature, Scripture says, to be a servant. If you remember back in verse 1 where Paul introduces himself in 1 1, when Paul introduces himself to the church at Philippi, when Paul writes this letter back to them, Paul has a unique way of addressing himself to the Philippians church. If you've read Paul's other letters, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you know, he's got a bunch of other stuff he's written, first and second Corinthians, and on and on and on. When Paul writes those letters, in his introduction, he says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus. Or something to that effect, right? That's like when you're sitting at the hospital and the doctor walks in the room and he says, Hi, I am Dr. So-and-so. Or she says, Hi, I'm Dr. So-and-so. They introduce themselves as a doctor because they're the expert, right? If the janitor walked in, you'd want to know they were the janitor and not the doctor, 
right? So the doctor walks in and says, hi, I'm Dr. Smith. And that's the way Paul would address himself as he would write letters to these churches. Hey, I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm the one who had this experience with Jesus. I am the one who has this special calling. I have this right, this privilege, and this duty to instruct you in how to live spiritually. But there's one lone exception to that. When he writes the Philippians, he doesn't say, I, Paul, the apostle. And he doesn't do that for the very reason, because he loves this church and they love him. The relationship, the depth of love they have for one another. And so instead what Paul writes, he says, I, Paul, a doulos. I, Paul, a servant. I, Paul, a slave or servant. That's literally what doulos means. The Greek word doulos. He says, I kneel down and I am here to serve God and to serve you. In fact, as you translate this word, uh, I've worked through this word extensively. This is one of the very first words. If you take a seminary Greek course, this is one of the first words you'll really dig into in almost any seminary because it's such an important word. And when you dig into this word of doulos, a slave, a servant, what it means is someone who is permanently devoted to do the will of another. Paul is saying, I am permanently devoted to to do God's will. I, Paul, a slave or a servant. Jesus made himself nothing so that he could become a doulos, a servant to us, so that he could be permanently devoted to do the will of the one who sent him. And that is the mind shift that Paul is saying we too need to have. It's not about us. It's about God. It's not about, hey, look, how good am I, right? But it's self-abandonment. I lose my life so that I might find it. Here's one more mind shift if you're taking notes today. Continuing on with Paul's writing, Paul is going to tell us that serving, serving is not what I do, but rather a servant is who I am. And there's an important mind shift. A servant is not what I do, but rather a servant is who I am. Right? Do you think of yourself that way? I know I find myself often thinking of service as the thing that I go do. But that's not what we're taught in Scripture. Being a servant is from the outflow of the inpouring of the Spirit of God. Being a servant is from the overflow of the goodness God has put into us. Being a servant is from what God has given us is abundant life that we might live abundantly, Scripture tells us. And when you have an abundance, that means you have enough to share. That means you have enough to give. It means you have enough that it's spilling out of your pockets. That's the kind of grace that we've been given, folks. That's the kind of love Jesus has given us. A never-ending, never-stopping, unbelievable, unimaginable love. It's more than just drinking from the fire hose. He's poured the whole ocean of grace upon us. And if that's what we have received, let's channel and let that flow elsewhere. Let us never be the stopping point of God's grace and love. And so Paul is telling us being a servant isn't just something that we do. It needs to be at the core of our being. A servant is who I am. As a Christ follower, that is my identity. I don't just go to church simply just to serve. I go to church because I'm a follower of Christ. When somebody's in need, I don't just go like, hey, you know, I'm going to go do something for them. No, instead, I go and do something for them because it's an overflow of the love that was first given to me. If I'm going to serve them because I want to be a servant, quickly that will become selfish and self-motivated. Ooh, look at me. Look at the good works that I'm doing, right? But if instead I'm going as an overflow, if I'm loving as an overflow, if I'm giving as an overflow of what God has given to me, it wasn't mine to begin with. 
right? And as I redirect that and as I channel that out, it's God's glory that's going out, not mine. A servant is who I am if I belong to Christ. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served by others. He said, I came to serve, to be a servant. And how did Jesus serve? Well, verses 8 through 11 tell us very clearly. Some of the most important passages in Scripture here. He says this, that Jesus being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? That's what Jesus did. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a doulos. One who was totally devoted to the will of another. That's what Jesus did when he came. Now I want you to think about that though. I'm going to read to you some other well-known verses from this passage from the book of Philippians. And I want you to ask yourself, how could Paul, again, Paul who was chained 24 hours a day to a Roman soldier, how could Paul, as he's awaiting a trial that would determine his fate, whether he would live or whether he would die, how could Paul, knowing fully well that they might say, you're guilty, and execute him, how could Paul say something as insanely beautiful as this? To live as Christ and to die as gain. How could he say, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I might do the will of God? How could he say, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord? How could he say, while he was in house arrest, do not be anxious about anything. Right? He says that the church at Philippi. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. How could Paul say that? Well, Paul could say that because if you think like Jesus thought, you can live like Jesus lived. Shifting our minds. It's not about me. It's all about him. Serving's not what I do. Serving instead is who I am. Pleasing God isn't about self-promotion. Pleasing God is about self-abandonment. The final thought that I want to leave you with today is this. That our joy, our personal joy, is not based on what is happening to us in the moment, but on what God is doing in me and through me. This is perhaps the most difficult of all the things that I've been talking about to, to really take to heart. It's so easy to base our joy on what's happening today, right? How are you doing today? Well, stubbed my toe this morning, so I'm doing terrible. Right? How are you doing today? Well, my wife is homesick, so mm, not so good. Right? How are you doing today? Ah, stock market's down, so terrible. How are you doing today? Right? It's easy to get caught up in our day to day lives, seeing the good or seeing the bad. How are you doing today? Well, the kids were a handful this morning, and we were late to school, and Johnny forgot his lunch, and I had to drive back home and get that, and that made me late to work, and then when I got to work, my boss yelled at me, and then my first call, my first customer didn't go well, and all in all, I'm doing great. What? What do you mean you're doing great? Well, these things are temporary, folks. Do those things really matter in the bigger scheme of things? Our joy isn't based on what is happening to me in the temporary, but on what God is doing in me and through me. 
Paul writes these words at the end of what we're going to look at here in verse 17. Paul knows that he may well be dying soon. And in fact, he did die relatively shortly after writing this letter to the church of Philippi. And Paul writes back to them. He says to them, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, as a sacrifice for your faith, Paul says, even if they execute me. Paul says, even if they kill me, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. Paul, chained to a Roman soldier, 24 hours a day, could have looked at that and said, woe is me. Instead, Paul looks at that and goes, ha, you can't get away and I'm telling you about Jesus. And they switched guys four times a day. So four times a day, he got to look at a new guy and go, ha, you can't get away and I'm telling you about Jesus. Right? He saw that as an opportunity. How many of us think the same way, though, when things don't go our way in life? Cancer, death of a loved one, stock market tanks, our house gets flooded in the basement and the insurance company won't pay for it. That happened to me, right? How many of us think that way? Oh, this is a great opportunity. Yeah? It might not be a great opportunity, but it is a great opportunity to bring glory to God. And Paul says, no matter what comes, whether they kill me, whether they leave me in chains, or they set me free, I am glad and I rejoice with you. In other words, if this costs me everything, so what? Let me make much of Jesus all along the way. That is what it's about at the end of the day. Loving God, loving others in radical ways because God first loved us so that therefore we may then love others. As you go this week, think these things over. Take these things to heart. Shift your mind. Make it less about you and more about the other. And if every day you choose to do that, if every day in little ways you choose to transform your mind, if every day you choose to live a little bit more like Jesus, to think a little bit more like Jesus, if you do that in small baby steps every day, it begins to add up. And as it begins to add up, the world is going to see. And as the world sees, you will make a difference. God is clear on that. So as you go forth this week, go forth loving and serving and sharing as Jesus loved and served and shared. Amen. Let's close in prayer.